I first of all, I want to turn um, to Rowan Williams, former Archbishop of Canterbury. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I mean, how concerned are you about both the exposure of the inequalities that we've seen over the past couple of years, but also worsening inequalities? It's one of the things that the pandemic really has brought into focus for us, I think. And it seems to me that we've looked at two different kinds of inequality coming to focus. What you might call inequality of security, that is, people of experiencing such widely different levels of reliability in their background. They, they know they're more at risk. And inequalities of exposure to infection and to the results that follow from that. So, yes, I'm concerned. I'm concerned that it's, it's widening a gap that's already too wide. And as a society, right at the beginning, particularly with things like clapping for the NHS, we thought we were sort of coming together as a nation. But now I'm slightly fearful that possibly we're seeing a fracturing again. What, what, what do you think? I think we've forgotten what, what we began to learn in those first months. And what we were learning at that point, I think, was the incredible disparity in reward for people in our society. Mm. People who take the greatest risks, who undergo the greatest exposure for the sake of the community, have some of the lowest rewards. We, we saw that in terms of the NHS and care workers and all those people like... Uh, waste collectors who keep things running and who are, on the whole, right on the margins of any discussion we have on prosperity and collective well-being, whereas at the same time, certain kinds of profession, certain kinds of activity are rewarded in a way which, by almost any standards, is just wildly and unrealistically disproportionate. Now, there's tons more I want to talk about with uh, both you, Ray, and also Jeremy and Jess. Don't go away. Uh, lots more from my brilliant guests after the break. Uh, welcome back. The former Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, is still with me. Uh, Rowan, you take a bit of an interest in standards in public life. One of the things that Tory MPs and indeed some Tory ministers now say to me uh, is that they think even if the Prime Minister is fined uh, for breaking the Covid rules that he wrote, he wouldn't have to resign. Do you think that you know, previous ministers, Prime Ministers, would have been able to survive something like this? I very much doubt it, actually. I think there's, there's a sense that something is owed to the public in terms of trustworthiness. And it's not about... It, it's, a, it's a general point, I think, about our society. It's not so much just about our rights. It, it is about what others have a right to expect from us, about the respect that I think a population can expect from those in power, what they can expect in terms of being treated seriously, being taken seriously. But why do you think the Tory MPs who talk to me don't share the view that the public are owed that respect? I doubt they disagree that the public is owed respect. I think they would say, well, this is a, a grey area, this is an area where a lot of people have been um, probably transgressing in mild ways. So why should, why should someone in public life be uh, held to a higher standard? But I think that's always been the case, that there's been a sense that the way in which people in public life do respond, the, the degree of transparency and honesty that, that they show is a mark of what is owed to the people they serve. I mean, Jeremy, the very first line of the ministerial code that Boris Johnson signed when he became Prime Minister says that ministers, including the Prime Minister, should be held to the highest possible standard. And I think uh, we are held to higher standards than members of the public, and we should be, mm -hmm. because we aspire to lead, and with that leadership comes responsibilities. Um, but we don't yet know what the outcome of the police inquiry is, and no. I think that... Uh, but I, I think it's reasonable to, to say... debate theoretically if he were fined for breaking his own rules. As I say, as certainly some of your colleagues have had no hesitation in saying to me they think he shouldn't resign. They're debating it. So do you think he should resign in those circumstances? Well, I think you're wrong to treat Tory MPs as a class of people who all think the same. <laughs> I think that there are lots of very different views among the colleagues that I speak to. Um, and I'm no doubt that people would say it's a very serious issue if a uh, Prime Minister broke one of the laws that he himself decided to introduce. Mm -hmm. But um, we aren't at that point yet. And I think that we have to wait and decide uh, our views when we hear what the police actually say. And they are doing that inquiry now. And just to be clear, therefore, 
you're not prepared to say tonight how you are going to decide uh, what to do in those circumstances. Well, I think given the things that we've been discussing earlier in the programme, this isn't the moment to launch into a lot of speculation about what might happen in those kinds of situations. But, of course, it would be very serious. Yeah. Uh, Anushka, I think you've got something you want to show us. Oh, yeah, should I just show you a couple of things that are happening in on social media and tomorrow. This is the Metro front page, which is quite interesting. It's the Defence Secretary's Ben Wallace's comments. Putin's gone full tonto. And I just wanted to show you a tweet that's come in as we've been on air from Antonella Guerrera from it it Italy's La Repubblica. The Kremlin says rebel leaders in eastern Ukraine have asked Russia for military help to fend okay. off Ukrainian aggression. Thanks, Anushka. Well, that's all. Uh, it only gets worse, doesn't it? Um, can I just ask you, in terms of where we are in this conflict now, um, you've said, I think, that you slightly wish, we're on, when we were on the cusp of going to war in Iraq, that you'd spoken out l more loudly against that intervention. What is your current assessment about the way Western governments are handling this? I think that I'd want to see as always, all other options explored before we think about military intervention. It's, it's a slightly different case from, yeah. from Iraq in, in any event. But what is, I think, really at the top of anybody's wish list here is that we find some strategy which will cost Putin domestically. Mm. Not just cost the country, because that, that will happen too, but cost Putin um, some of his own popularity. Because Russia is it's a huge fragile, hypersensitive cluster of communities. It's not, it's not any more monolithic than Tory MPs, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's, that's something to bear in mind here. And I think if, if we can find ways of just not making it worthwhile for the Russian people as a whole, as well as for Putin, short of war, because I think a war which has no obvious goal or end on either side is the worst of all possible worlds. It's not clear what Vladimir Putin's long-term practical plans are. We know, we know the mythology, we know the big story that he's, he's working with. We don't know the detail. Equally, it would be quite complicated, I think, to, to identify what we would want to achieve in response. So that's why I hope you know, military conflict is very much a the last option when we've thought about all those diplomatic and economic pressures. I mean, Jeremy, one of the things that, um, when I talk to security experts about this, I mean, they, you know, of course it's the case that within a country as big and with its kind of history, there are going to be diverse views, but Putin is remarkably powerful. Uh, I mean, you know, just in a purely personal sense. And there are not people around him, uh, I am told, who hold him in check in any meaningful sense and actually he is somebody who seems to be an absolute master of basically you know essentially personifying himself with the state and when he's and, and and basically persuading russian people that any attack on him is attack is an attack on them mm. well this is why it is such an incredibly dangerous situation mm. and i think when we make the comparison with iraq we should remember that saddam hussein was never a, a threat to the entire international order mm in the way that Putin is. And in some ways, it's actually more dangerous than under the Soviet Union in the Cold War, because then Russia and China were not together, mm. and we were able to bankrupt the Soviet Union. Now we have a China that, in the next decade, will become bigger economically than the United States in a firm alliance mm. with Russia. So it is a very, and do you very think, dangerous And do you situation. think China will take up the slack of financing Putin the more that we turn off the tap? Of course they will do that to a certain extent but in the end the world's wealth is still overwhelmingly concentrated in the west so if we choose to use economic levers we do actually have the upper hand still yeah and how would you see i mean because i think you you actually love like russia as i understand it how would you see putin in a in a historical context like like the czars like stalin like the czars in some respect but also i think that the speech which has been so much discussed about ukraine really rehearses a, a large number of long-standing Russian tropes, the sense of victimhood, the sense oh, yeah. that this, this enormous country has actually always been on the receiving end of, of aggression, 
Oh. And unfortunately, I've been told we're out of time, which is incredibly frustrating because I was so enjoying talking to you. Now, that's it. We will treat you next week. We'll be here on Monday, not Wednesday, because if somehow you didn't know, the FA Cup is on ITV next week. I'm not that interested because my team's out. See you soon.